Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Las Vegas for IBM Impact. This is Silicon Angles The Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and expect to see them from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angles, joined my co-host Paul Gillen. And our next guest is uh, Kerry McGuire, Vice President of Strategy of Internet of Things at ARM. Welcome to theCUBE. Oh, thank you, thanks for having me. We'd love to have you here. We got some props here. ARM obviously is a hot uh, topic uh, in any conversation. Obviously, low power, high performance. This is the future of computing, making things smaller, faster, cheaper, faster, all that stuff is great. And certainly, you know, we heard from Power earlier today around some of their initiatives. Uh, Internet of Things is a hot trend. You're hearing uh, you know, edge of the network, Devices, Nest was bought by billion for billions of dollars from Google. These are the hot trends. So, uh, tell us why are you here at Medium Impact, and then we'll come to some of the ARM questions. Well, I mean, Internet of Things is a hot trend, and from ARM, we're, we really look at the opportunity from sensors all the way to servers. So, there's an explosion of innovation around devices. And, uh, and the software technologies that will help uh, developers really deploy applications. And, and really, the, one of the things that we're really here to share is, um, you know, we, we were at the heart of the mobile evolution. And what really happened in mobile was devices became capable, they were, they were equipped with web technologies, and the development um, engaged, or the way we engage developers really changed. And that spurred a massive a level of growth and innovation. And so what we think is possible is to bring those same dynamics to the Internet of Things and begin to sort of, you know, really uh, accelerate deployment to these types of systems. So share with the folks out there, do your, uh, your best post to the camera, the, the devices you have. You can zoom in on this. I don't know if you can hold it up through the camera there. Oh, yeah, I've got a couple of systems. So, so one aspect of how we're engaging developers is we have a project called Embed. It's embed.org. And this is an environment where we work with our silicon partners to provide very low cost development platforms that enable the creator of new connected things to uh, develop a device very quickly. And so here's two examples. This is an original board from NXP um, that was has been uh, probably the flagship device in Embed. And here's a new uh, system from Nordic with a Bluetooth, uh, low energy Bluetooth connectivity in it. So with these new systems and with the fundamental software elements, developers can prototype a device quickly and have sort of the on-ramp to the application world to partners like IBM. Yeah, sure. So one of the things that uh, we've been, Paul and I were talking on the intro when we were talking earlier is it's a big trend right now in developers is this maker movement. Absolutely. And you know, it's the tinkerer homebrew club where in the old days back when Apple started, you didn't know someone who worked at HP or these Intel to get these devices. <laughs> but now the developers have access to this stuff. What are you seeing from a creativity perspective? What is being unleashed by this? Oh, I, th I think it's tremendous. The, uh, the embed boards we have here are based off of Cortex-M processors, which are tiny little 32-bit processors. You can, you can um, stick one on the, on the dimple of a golf ball. Uh, Freescale is a device that small. And, and with these kinds of devices and these kind of development environment, you can create very disruptive products. And so already in the Cortex-M space, we see a lot of innovation around the wearable market, new devices being uh, created in that space. We see some creativity coming from some new industrial applications. So um, we, we share the belief that you know, perhaps as much of a third of these developments will come from tiny little startup companies. And that's, that's really um, why we're engaging developers in this way. Carrie, uh, power consumption seems to be a, a gating factor for a lot of applications. We hear things like uh, Google Glass. You know, one, of the, one of the complaints I've heard about Google Glass from early adopters is that you only get about an hour of power out of it. Do you, do you see, as someone who's on the front lines of this, is there sort of a Moore's law of power consumption that we're going to see where, where power uh, efficiency is going to improve at some predictable scale? Uh, there, there's some exciting transitions in power. Um, but first of all, we have a breadth of products that we're feeding into Internet of Things devices. So many of the, the first generation products are based off of mobile processors, which are um, positioned to drive very high-end graphics and engagement. But most Internet of Things devices don't have that kind of interactive um, requirement. And so processors like the Cortex-M have a fraction of the power consumption. And the thing that most excited me this year at the Consumer Electronics Show was many of those systems being demonstrated with energy harvesting techniques. So, um, you know, enough- Generating their own power. Generating their own power, using technologies like uh, low power wireless over 802.15.4, six low pan technologies um, without batteries to share their information over the internet to cloud applications. That is disruptive because that creates an opportunity to quickly add context that can be you know, deployed and forgotten about. I know batteries are not your area, but 
Uh, we've heard, uh, I heard John Doerr last fall talking about uh, disruptive technology and batteries uh, coming, coming along in the near term. You, I'm sure you work with a lot of battery providers. Do you see a big breakthrough technology there that is going to change the game? I, I you know, I, I, battery's been a hard go for a long time to see transformative. We certainly see transformative form factors. We, we see techniques like ener energy harvesting, taking the pressure off of battery situations. Um, we think power is going to be um, you know, something that our partners will have to excel out for a long time. Now, you're here at, uh, at IBM. We were just talking to Doug Bailog from uh, IBM Power in a previous conversation. He was talking about uh, where they want to move their uh, their chips, and, and there's some overlap with where you're going with ARM. Well, you have a strong embeddable store. You also want to move into the server space. Are you competing with Power at the same time you're sort of cooperating here? Well, I mean, it's, it's a great question. We're a partnership company. We work with many companies, but I, I think I shared earlier, we think of, of the Internet of Things for ARM as being from sensors to servers. And one of the unique thing about the ARM partners is their ability to take our processor technology and put intelligence around the system. And in, in data center applications or industrial gateways that have data center-like capabilities, I think there's a real value to that type of a heritage where they can optimize for storage uh, to support analytics, where they can optimize for networking capabilities to you know, um, really make the traffic patterns work for the application. Um, so, so we we do anticipate, you know, arms 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 partners are investing. We have partners like Marvell and AMD making chips with very high end capabilities that will absolutely find their way into data centers. Um, but I also think there's some interesting opportunities in these sort of embedded systems that are essentially, you know, data centers in a box being deployed, you know, at the edge of these IoT applications. Will the, will this market uh, uh, fragment uh, the, the embeddable uh, the embeddable processor market? You see there being a great many. Uh, providers uh, in the long term, or will consolidate and will ARM uh, possibly be the big winner? Well, I mean, certainly um, one of the big distinctions we have from the mobile industry to the Internet of Things is diversity. And diversity not only in the devices, but the applications and the requirements that they, that they really uh, you know, need to bring to the, bring to the consumers. And so we we really anticipate that's a big shift, and we think diversity has to you know has to be fostered in the industry, and, and will continue. And, and I think that is a good place for ARM to be uh, working on some of these software challenges to make that diversity be palatable to the application. Can you talk about workable. what diversity means? What, just define diversity. Yeah, sure. So we see a lot of diversity in processor capabilities. So I mentioned before we have, um, you know, most of the mobile technology and server technology may be based on a Cortex A family of processor, very high end capabilities. You may see eight core implementations, four core implementations, two or you know, so a lot of diversity in level of processing. Um, our Cortex M family is, is is tiny. You can see that in a 50 cent connected sensor device. So, you know, quite a range of capabilities hitting all of the different propositions. I also think connectivity is an area where we're going to see a lot of diversity. Um, we believe, you know, al although today a lot of the MDIM applications have evolved from a, um, a cellular connected heritage, we're seeing a lot of explosion around technologies like Bluetooth, 802.15.4, so very low power wireless um, being the on-ramp for these new types of devices. So I think we'll see a lot of diversity around this. You things. said sensors to servers. I love that phrase. I never yeah. wrote that down. It's so good. Um, let's talk about the servers. So, you know, the data center obviously is, is um, really in need of ARM technology. What's, uh, how does that connect to the edge with the Internet of Things? Well, I, I, again, I think one of, the, one of the great things about the ARM partners is, is we've come from a connected context for, you know, from the start. And that really, um, when you think about how a mobile system is deployed, hardware and software, being connected, you have to have special care around power consumption because you're really utilizing a processor and trying to optimize within a particular power envelope. You know, data centers, although they're powered, they're still very power efficient. So I think the heritage we have around um, uniquely targeted systems for specific applications and this long-standing uh, relationship with connectivity and power uh, is an advantage for our partners. I know operating systems are not your focus, but uh, I'll tell you, I saw a demo recently uh, of how easy it was to hack into an Android phone. Uh, within a minute, the guy was in the phone, he was pulling out all the data, and he had, he had uh, taken control of the camera and the microphone. And the, the CIOs in the audience were, were uh, uh, they were shocked. 
Uh, and the point was that, that, that as we move toward more, toward Internet of Things and more embeddable devices, right. we're going to have a profusion of operating systems, each bringing with it their own security vulnerabilities. Is this a problem? Is this something that, that IT folks should be worried about? Well, I mean, I, I think it's a great point you make, and, and when, we, when we talk about the future of the Internet of Things, one of the points I often like to bring up is, is we could have done security better in mobile earlier. And, and when we think about a diversity of devices connecting in a transparent way, the way the Internet of Things wants to be, security has to be at the heart. Um, so we've, uh, we're investing in technologies. We acquired a company, Sensinode, who provides software that connects little devices to cloud applications. And they deploy an end-to-end -end security model. And we think that there's you know, fundamentals around little devices being able to you know, connect over IP-based networks. Um, with end-to-end -end security models is the necessary foundational agreement to have the right um, technology to start to solve that security problem in the Internet of Things. I think it's a big one for us to solve together as an industry, and I think it will take cooperation around standards that will support uh, the security models we need. What are some of the big things you're seeing right now in terms of the adoption? Obviously, you hear about the Internet of Things, you know, water, water meters, uh, normal kind of normal lives. Uh, are being instruments physically, not just from the software, but the top early markets for you guys in this area. Oh no, it, and we're really seeing a lot of growth in two areas. We have um, certainly around you know some of our more traditional mobile partners. We'll see, we're seeing a lot of innovation around wearables. It's a natural fit for our partners who have been you know at the heart of the mobile industry. Um, so, so, so many different types of connected products in that space. However, we have a lot of our partners, uh, a good volume of, of our shipments now come from the embedded space. And in that space, we have hardware and software technology being deployed in places like municipal lighting deployments in smart cities and factory and industry automation. Um, and in many ways, a lot of some of these new um, ideas around end-to-end -end security models are evolving from those industrial applications. And so that's where we're seeing some of this early technology be adopted. Uh, you, uh, I'm sure you see a lot of cool stuff because you're working with companies that are that are working on the, on the stuff that we'll see in a year. Uh, are, are there any applications of embedded devices that have surprised you, stuff you just didn't expect to see? Yes, absolutely. I think the one that was most surprising to me, and it really sort of points out the value of adding a service to your product, and and uh, was was a partner of ours um, who invest who uh, uh, in, in or um, put technology into a, a pill. And the purpose of the technology was to ensure that you took your medication on time. And their service related to um, making sure that if that didn't happen on time, they were able to engage the patient. And the result was better outcomes. So, this, so that type of model really started to change my thinking around how impactful uh, connecting devices and building a, a, an application of service around it could be. That's probably the most surprising. Well, we've heard of ingestible device. I mean, yeah. is there, is there, do you see a, a large scale adoption of that? I'm sure that there are, uh, I mean, anybody's going to have sort of a visceral reaction to that idea of swallowing a chip, should they? Uh, we, we, we think there are great, great innovations around there. So, so you know, I think, you know, we, we talked earlier about diversity. I think we're going to see a lot of innovation happening around the edges in these new industries as things become connected. Um, so there are a lot of great, great opportunities there. I guess we swallow worse things than chips, don't we? <laughs> so the final question I have you, what's, the, what's your take on IBM Impact and some of the customer conversations you've had here around the ARM and Internet of Things? Well, what I think is really interesting, of course, ARM sits at the middle of a hardware ecosystem, you know, the, 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 the ecosystem that's making the connected products. And, and, I, and what is really apparent, you know, under, you know, here today at Impact is where IBM sits in the broader sort of application and enterprise deployment. Yet the theme around how we deploy more quickly and easier, how we engage developers differently, is a very common theme we're seeing across the spectrum. Um, so I think that's exciting, and, and I think that that's the pace of innovation we're going to need for the Internet of Things to be successful. You see a lot of developers just here in the social lounge, they have the Raspberry Pi, tinkering around, building out stuff. I mean, it's packed. People love this oh, stuff. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and, and the faster we can connect them you know, through software initiatives you know, straight into the application and the enterprise partners, the faster we'll see uh, you know, new products be deployed. Is hardware tinkering cool again? 
Oh, I think, hard, yeah, I, I, I certainly think it is. Around the embed community, we've got you know hundreds of OEMs developing products. We have you know millions of visitors engaging. So what it's, would you tell a high school student today? Should you go into software or you should go, you go into hardware development? Well, I, th I think it's a, good, it's a good question, but but the, I, what I want to say is around these sort of development environments, you have such an easy kit that allows you to mix and match components with hardware, have access to those software drivers that it's almost just like software and you know connecting the tools and writing applications so I, I think this is a real change so, so the the long history of being a really geeky hardware engineer is changing with these types of uh, initiatives and getting the stuff access, having access to the devices is key it's like it's build your own market it's great right. Carrie thanks so much for coming on the cube we're here at IBM impact in Las Vegas talking internet of things talking about software development this is the new maker movement this is the homebrew club of the future um, it's really great innovation thanks for joining us this is the cube we'll be right back with our next guest after this short break yes, thank you